friend Patrick. Today we have uh, Ayla Cuenca, right? Am I pronouncing that right? You sure are. Okay, and um, I'm kind of um, I'm kind of dipping into uncharted waters here a little bit because I, I I don't know really anything about this subject or very little at least. But we started talking online, and you told me a couple things, and I immediately was kind of fascinated by you know sort of peering into the corner of, you know, this little corner of what is usually uh, the allopathic, very allopath, part of the allopathic system. Um, And I'm so I'm not very familiar with like any holistic type of, um, you know, uh, procedures, if you will. So what so you are a a holistic uh, birth guide and a doula. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, excuse me. Um, Yeah, holistic birth guide. So from preconception into parenting, um, what I really aim to do is offer education and guidance for women and couples and families who just are looking for more alternative approaches to this (laughs) very common path that most of us choose to take. And what's available to us is typically very conventional. That's, you know, when you search for natural birth online, you basically like the first three pages of Google are like OBs who support natural birth. So it's like you're just funneled right back into the allopathic system. And I think people are just trying to find something that is more in tune with what they're intuiting, which is maybe like a low intervention birth or, you know, feeling unobstructed or feeling like there might be something more than just checking into the hospital and getting an epidural and having your baby born there, you know? So uh, yeah, I offer that guidance. And then I'm also a doula, which is like an emotional and physical support person during the pregnancy and the birth. Um, And, you know, that word has become kind of charged for me because I find that there are so many doula trainings now where you just take a weekend course and you're a doula and you're guiding people through this process that is quite precarious. and delicate. And um, the woman will remember it for the rest of her life. So it's a lot of responsibility. And so I've just kind of been shifting away from that term. But uh, I also work in placenta encapsulation and placentophagy. So I train different people on how to prepare placentas after the birth so that they can use that for nourishment in their postpartum period. I'm going to ask you about that for sure. Um, but what is so what is the difference between uh what you do in a midwife. Yeah. So a midwife. midwife. Yes. Yeah. Midwife. Um, There are different types of midwives. There's what I call medwives that are more trained in the hospital system, uh, more involved in the whole medical industrial complex. Um, And they, they are medical professionals, you know, they offer prenatal care, they do blood work. um, They can prescribe different medications, uh, they are really there as gatekeepers for the woman during her experience in pregnancy and childbirth. And then they also offer postpartum care so they can come and check on the newborn. They're trained in all these newborn procedures um, and they're continuously checking on the woman for the weeks after the birth. And this is different than an OB because an OB is a medical doctor who's really a surgeon and they're really more trained in emergency situations and high risk cases. Um, that's really their area of expertise. So they're very different, um, but they are both considered what is the gatekeeper of a birth experience for a woman. Um, And then the doula is a non-medical professional. So I don't diagnose anything. I don't do vaginal exams. I don't take blood pressure. I don't deliver babies. (laughs) I don't give medical advice. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So what is the process as it stands typically you know using the allopathic system how does that go and what are the differences you know major differences between um you know having a just a normal hospital birth and you know doing like at home or you know with a doula and all that 
so it's like it's very different and um kind of dramatically captivating from the start when you decide to go to see a conventional doctor at the beginning of your pregnancy um you, know, you become pregnant you're excited but you're also like oh this is something that i have to monitor like i should go see someone i should go talk to someone about this and so you go and maybe you do a google search for an ob or an ob gyne that has a really you know really good reviews and then you go into the you know the appointment and they spend about 20 minutes with you they might confirm the pregnancy with an ultrasound and they'll say okay you know sign up with us we're going to have you come in in a few weeks to do this test we're going to do a genetic screening uh, you know, maybe they tell the woman she looks kind of petite. So then they'll say, well, we're just going to keep an eye on this because if your baby gets, you know, too big throughout the pregnancy, we want to make sure that the size of the baby is still compatible with your capabilities to birth them. And so you get a lot of information from the beginning. And already there is this um, kind of undertone that you need to be monitored. And this is something to watch because it could get out of control. So that's the energy that could happen, that, that often happens. And many of my students that come to me are like already in a fear space <laughs> after meeting with the doctor. And they're like, I've been working with this gynecologist for years and I trust them and now I'm pregnant. And suddenly I feel like I need to really be monitored. Like I'm excited, but like we really need to keep an eye on X, Y, Z. And, you know, I'm in my thirties. So they're telling me I'm high risk. And, you know, there's all these things that come along with, with stepping into that space. And, and then I find with midwifery care, like what you know, you could consider the alternative route. Um, midwives will typically spend more time with you if you're working with like a certified professional midwife or a lay midwife who has a birth center, or has her own practice and she just does home births. She'll typically spend more time getting to know you. She wants to know about your family. She wants to know about your history. Um, she wants a whole picture, and she'll do a risk assessment to see if you're even a candidate to have a home birth. Uh, someone who has uh, severe diabetes or a heart condition or obesity, for example, would not be a good candidate for a home birth because they would need medical support during the birth itself. So the midwife won't take someone on like that. So they eliminate, or they, I should say, they edit out anyone who wouldn't be a good candidate for that experience. Um, and from there, it's, it's typically very celebratory. And every time you go to your prenatal appointments with your midwife, you know, they ask you what you would like to do or what you would like to accomplish in that meeting. And um, yeah, I generally find that it's, it's more positive and empowering because the woman starts to feel like she's doing something and her body is doing something that is positive and natural. And it's not a medical condition that she's dealing with. So I find that to be the, the general undertone for that experience when you kind of walk into that path. And it's not to say that every midwife is this like amazing <laughs> individual that's going to lift you up and offer you this positive experience. For, for the most part, I do see that though. And it's not to say that OBs are, you know, inherently, go, you know, trying to make this a negative experience for you. It's just their training. It's the way that they view pregnancy they view it as a, as a branch of medicine and it's not mm -hmm. um so but it's treated as such that's really interesting i have noticed that just from friends who have been pregnant you know there is a lot of like fear assigned and it is like something to be watched and yeah that's that's like a really interesting um kind of observation so you think that there's way like just way too much fear involved in the whole process Totally. I mean, look at how we're trained from childhood to view birth. It's like through the scope of Hollywood, <laughs> where like <laughs> the woman is like her water breaks and suddenly like everyone's rushing around to like grab the bag and then they get in the car and they're like running red lights and like right. she's screaming and like she wishes it never happened. But, like <laughs> she's, bl she's blaming her husband for doing this to her and it like becomes antagonistic. And then as soon as she gets to the hospital and she's like hooked up to the epidural and the drug, she's like, it's okay. Like it's going it's to be fine. <laughs> and then, and then the baby's born and like, it, we see this baby wrapped in blankets and in a hat and like completely clean and perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wait, what happened in between like the water breaking and then this little baby, you know, like it, it just is so, um, oh my God, it's just so heavily curated. 
And um, that's how we grow up. We grow up thinking it's this like very urgent situation that requires medical attention. And it can only happen successfully if we are within the hospital setting. And the times we've seen home birth depicted in Hollywood, it's like she had to transfer to the hospital or you know, everything that could go wrong went wrong, you know, and so that's, that's how we grow up viewing birth. And then that's compounded by negative birth stories that we hear. We have so many women now saying I had an emergency C-section, thank God I was at the hospital. Um, and so that's something I talk a lot about in my classes is, you know, when people tell me that this is my biggest fear, my sister had an emergency C-section, and I don't want it to happen to me. So I have to kind of take them back through the events to, to really illustrate how that woman arrived at her emergency C-section. And I'd say like 99% of the time, the woman opted, volunteered to have a medical procedure done, like receive an epidural or receive Pitocin, which is an induction drug to, in, to induce and start the labor, mm -hmm. or they receive um, you know, Demerol or Nubane, which are all opiates. So that's typically where it starts. Um, and then the baby, of course, reacts poorly to that. And yeah. we see heart rates drop. And, and then the woman needs to get a C-section because the baby's not processing it properly. And that's after an epidural, right? Yeah, which most people don't know what's in an epidural. It's you, you told know. me fentanyl, they use fentanyl? Fentanyl and lidocaine. And so, um, and that's what I mentioned to you in our previous conversation is that there are so many blind spots. Like people, yeah. a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm, I'm really pro medical freedom. And like, I'm a vegan and like, I only eat organic. And um, I would never use any sunscreen that has this ingredient in it. But then they completely subscribe to a full conventional pregnancy and birth experience. Yeah. Um, so there are blind spots and, and, you know, people say, I don't live in fear. Like I trust my body. I trust the power and the knowledge that my body carries. We're made perfectly. And then they subscribe to this type of birth because <laughs> there is, there is a fear factor that still exists within them. Yeah. I'll, I mean, weird. I'll admit the first thing I, I thought of when I hear or think of when I hear home birth is like, oh, my God, like the pain, uh, like how do people do that? And I mean, I think women who do that are complete rock stars. I don't know. My cousin did it. I, I mean, I don't know how how does that work? Because it, but it is like, you know, we are conditioned by movies and everything to to see all this pain and agony. And, and, and is it like that? And what you know, what is the pain like in a home birth? So the, the cool thing about birth and labor, so labor is this process that, that initiates when the baby is ready to be born. And there's a few stages of labor. And typically, not always, but typically it begins kind of slow and it builds. And as it builds, more hormones are released. The body begins to adapt to the sensations. And maybe if you're lucky, you have like a 12 hour labor and um, you've had time to really transition into the discomfort of the contractions. And by the time that you're ready to push, you've already reached this plateau. Um, you know, if you were to go from zero to 60, like go from no sensation to suddenly pushing, your body would probably go into shock. But that's the purpose of labor. It's meant to really gear you up and help you adapt over the course of the day to really meet that kind of high threshold of discomfort. Um, so it's, it's a really beautiful process. And, uh, that's why when women get these induction drugs to, to synthetically stimulate contractions, they all report that it's excruciatingly painful because they walked in there on a Monday morning at 8am after having breakfast and they get in bed into the hospital bed and they get injected or they get an IV of Pitocin and suddenly they start having very strong contractions, contractions that, you naturally would start to get over time and really build and ease into it. They're getting it kind of like right off the bat and their body can go into shock. It can be very painful. So Gosh. I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense, but um, I, you know, I had a, a, a home birth and I was way past my due date. Well, not way past, but 10 days. And in the state of Florida, midwives are legally obligated 
to transfer you to medical doctor care. So they really, they have to transfer you to hospital care. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way in Hades that I'm going to the hospital after doing this the way that I've done it. No. So I started doing all of these self induction techniques to stimulate my labor. And then finally I started getting some light contractions and I was like, it called her and I said, I'm in labor. You, you know, you can't transfer me, you know? <laughs> and she said, okay, as long as you're in labor. And that kind of went on Friday night all through Saturday, just kind of light, but it was there. And then Sunday, it really started taking hold. Um, and the key here is having endurance. You know, um, I was able to rest and sleep when I could. Um, I didn't wake up my husband at the time. I was like, he needs to sleep because I really need him to be present when I really actually need him. But all of this kind of lighter stuff I can manage on my own. Um, I used the hot tub, I used, you know, oils, I used different massage techniques with a tennis ball. I was really just like in this space. It's almost psychedelic and out of body. And then finally, when I was ready to start pushing, I felt that sensation, the urge to push. I did, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that it wasn't difficult. It's a lot of hard work. Um, but I had so much conviction about why I was doing this this particular way. And that's really what fueled me mm -hmm. was like, you know, and I, I had points where I was like, yeah, just, you know, call, call 911. <laughs> you know, they have, they have drugs on that ambulance. Like they yeah. could hook me up right here. <laughs> the midwife was like, I said, do you have anything for the pain? And she starts laughing. She's like, yeah, I have some marijuana in my car. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I need, <laughs> I need something stronger. And then I would kind of snap out of it and like take a nap. And then I'd wake up yeah. 20 minutes later and be like, okay, you know, so it's like, it's just this process you go through. But if you're in the hospital and you get to these kind of breaking points, it's very easy to say, yeah, just, just hook me up, yeah. you know? Just right. give me relief for 20 minutes. Um, so it's an endurance thing. It's psychological there, as well. But there is, and I heard you talk about this in another video I watched of you, um, that there is a function to the pain. Um, yeah. And you explained that, and I thought that made a lot of sense to me. Um, so it, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. So just to put it very simply, um, every time you contract in labor, you know, your, your uterus, which is a muscle, is doing this kind of uh, opening and closing, which is massaging the baby and encouraging it to move down. But every time the uterus contracts, you also feel sensation in the pelvis, the tailbone, the pubic bone. So all of these nerve endings are being fired off and it's uncomfortable. Some women report that it can feel orgasmic. Needless to say, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of stimulation. And when that stimulation happens, the, the quote unquote pain, um, a signal is sent to the brain to then release more hormones, more labor hormones that keep the momentum of labor going, right? And so the pain is not pointless, I like to say. And when we medicate from the waist down um, with an epidural, for example, or a saddle block or something of that nature, maybe a, a spinal tap, any kind of injection, uh, we, the body can get confused, like you might know that you're in labor, but the body doesn't know because it's no longer receiving those signals. And that's why often women say, oh, I got the epidural and then my contractions kind of died down or they slowed down and I had to get Pitocin to then bring them back up again. <laughs> and then the Pitocin really affected the baby's heart, heart rate. So then we had to do a C-section. Um, so it's this kind of cascade effect that can happen. But yeah, the body is so intelligent that way. Um, and you know, we're, we're releasing all this oxytocin every time we contract. It's the same thing that's released when we orgasm or when we hug someone for more than 10 seconds or when we kiss or when we stimulate the roof of the mouth. You know, There's a pressure point there that does release oxytocin. And all of that oxytocin is what's really preparing us to meet that baby and bond with that baby. And this, this happens for men as well when they hold their baby after the birth. Uh, or even just witnessing their partner, you know, birthing the baby and then holding the baby, that, that picture of love and that picture of accomplishment stimulates oxytocin for the male. So it's really, it's really a beautiful, perfectly designed uh, process. And unfortunately, the, the drugs do interfere. That's so telling. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it, 
it really does support the the idea that the the body is an intelligent you know self healing kind of you know thing that gives you all the signals you need right and and everything is there for a reason everything is there to tell you something and and it performs its own function so i thought that was so so cool because we look at it as such a negative thing right the pain and but even that has its purpose yeah how do the if you don't mind me asking how do the women in your family talk about birth or how does your mother recall the experience if she's even recalled it to you uh, we, I mean, I don't think we've really talked about it at length, um, aside from like what time it happened. Um, sure. No, I mean, she, she just said like, you know, I w- probably made a, a comment about like how hard it was, but that, yeah, she never really <laughs> went into detail. Like, you know, she tried to guilt trip me about it. Um, <laughs> and- <laughs> like I did this for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, my sister has never never talked to me about it so yeah oh and she has she has kids she has one kid yeah yeah well maybe ask yeah yeah it would be an interesting conversation to have um but yeah i guess primarily you know i was i was raised by tv and (laughs) movies to learn about all that stuff so that's why i'm talking to someone like you and uh <laughs> learning the truth yeah. i mean this whole past year and a half has really been uh so many discoveries for me personally you know as far as the allopathic system and and how we're really programmed to perceive our our health and our bodies and and everything entwined in that so mm-hmm. yeah this is like i said another co- little corner of that to to discover um, oh yeah yeah it's how we come into this physical right and it's grossly overlooked yeah yeah I can imagine. even people who are really you know kind of on the front lines of um, advocating for children's rights mm. overlook birth as, as a as an important subject matter right but that's kind of where it all starts and um, that's where a woman or a baby might receive antibiotics for example like a lot of women receive antibiotics during labor mm. for really unnecessary reasons oftentimes and the baby is exposed to four bags of penicillin <laughs> before it's even born oh, wow. you know so if we're talking about microbiome and um, immunity like how do they even have a chance once they've been completely i mean it's like a nuclear bomb so if you believe in that but it's you know they've been, really been wiped out and yeah, then they're I mean, born if you've watched this show you know i am a big believer in in the terrain model of health so antibiotics are like not a thing <laughs> that i would that i would really do anymore um because i you know right. i view bacteria as a response um and not not to be killed off because it's th- like everything else it's there for a reason so. Well, yeah, this might be of interest to you. Um, the GBS bacteria that exists in everyone's rectum is, it can travel to the vaginal canal in pregnancy. And the U.S., I think, is the only country that actually tests for it when a woman is at the end of her pregnancy. And a lot of women test positive, meaning that it really just that the bacteria has colonized in the vaginal canal. And then they prescribe that a woman has to receive penicillin throughout her labor to make sure that all the bacteria is killed off so that the baby doesn't receive the bacteria. However, you know, we're completely made up of bacteria. And so it's, you know, the women, you know, they'll write to me and say, I have this infection. I'm like, you're not infected by anything. Like we all have this bacteria. (laughs) There's just an imbalance like candida or shigella or any other bacteria that exists within us. You know, that there's this kind of, it's like the master of survival. It's like this very delicate balance of being virulent or supportive. And that's where we are trying to exist. And so, yeah, it's, it's so common. I'd say like half of my, my clients are told that they're supposed to get a, an antibiotic during labor. And most of them get completely cornered into doing it by their OBs. They want to have just like the most sterile baby possible. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're, what I tell them is you're, you, they're trying to create a cash cow out of your child, basically. 
Yeah. So once, once you do this, it's going to be very difficult for them to be in a state of balance and health for the rest of their lives. So mm. they're just trying to get another customer from your child and from you. Oh. And a lot of people can understand that, but some people it's really difficult to deprogram um, the mommy medicine model from their existence. It, re it really is set up that way. And I don't think even a lot of doctors realize it, you know, because they're just, no. they're taught, they're taught that way that this is the right way, but really it is like, it's so like it, sinister <laughs> the way, like they kind of set things up to kind of screw you later, you know? Um, totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, that's what I want to ask you. So, okay. So the past year and a half, obviously has been i mean i don't know what happened um but obviously there's you know <laughs> more crazy protocols in hospitals restrictions um i don't even i don't even know the half of it as far as birth so what what has changed with this whole covid thing what have you had to endure and how are you you know uh how are you jumping those hurdles well, um, I, you know, I live in Florida. I'm so grateful. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, women were not allowed to have any partners with them in the hospital at all. It was like, no one can come in with you. So women were like contacting me. I need a midwife. I need to birth at home, you know, like a day before their due date or whatever. Oh. And I was really scrambling to try and help and accommodate because women should not be birthing in a room of strangers. You know, that's just not okay um I, they should at least have their partner there and then birth in a room with strangers <laughs> so they couldn't even have their partner and um and that's kind of how it all started and some hospitals throughout the country were recommending that women get epidurals so that they were immobile immobilized during the labor so that they couldn't tr they didn't you know they didn't have the urge to kind of get up and potentially walk around and spread the virus. And so there were all these like cockamamie ideas going around about what was safe and what was best practice. And I had a lot of home births scheduled, but I had a few hospital births scheduled to, to come in as a doula to support these women. And so I could no longer go in. And so then I was kind of offering digital support and FaceTiming with them. And it was a little bit of a mess. Hmm. Um, and, and then they, the hospitals kind of opened back up in South Florida, maybe like six months ago. But throughout this process, and even before the pandemic, I had decided that I was no longer going to be attending as many hospital births because over the last eight years, I've just witnessed so much abuse mm -hmm. um, toward women and toward babies. And um, I don't use that word lightly. I mean, literally abuse, like babies taken away from their mothers by nurses and then taken into other rooms. And then the mother's wondering where the baby is and they're saying we're running tests, but it's very unclear what the tests are and that no one knows anything. And so I just, it was too much for me personally. I couldn't handle it anymore. And yeah. so this for me was a big sign that I had to really transition out of attending so many births and, um, and really just focus on teaching, you know, which I have been for the last five years, but really just focus on giving people the tools to make their informed decisions and to really help them kind of remember what is already within them, this innate um, knowing of what feels right for them, you know, the, the body's innate ability to birth and, you know, just kind of helping people remember that um, and really training partners to be kind of like the doula. Um, and kind of taking a step back. Um, I know that in California now, I had a colleague text me, she works in Los Angeles, and she said that in order for a doula to enter into a hospital and support a family, she has to be fully vaccinated. Uh, you know, that's not happening here in Florida, you have to wear a mask. You know, one week you have to wear a mask, one week you have to get a PCR test to get in, the other week you don't need the PCR test, the other week you need to show proof of vaccination, and the other week, it's like, it's changing, every week and it's um really a shit show so you know what i recommend to women is that if you um are not high risk like genuinely high risk not like you're 37 that's not high risk so if you're genuinely high risk um then it, you know consider finding an ob in a hospital that's really going to work with you and your needs 
Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not not high risk at all, um, just don't birth in the hospital. Like it's never going to go the way you want it to go. Um, and I say that with great certainty. It's just not going to be compassionate. Um, you will be separated from your baby, uh, if not for a few hours, at least one to two hours, and that's unacceptable. So, yeah, I've just seen I've just seen it change week to week over the last year and a half, and um, I've had very few women give me positive feedback after their hospital experiences. I think you know this whole ex this whole pandemic has really compounded what was already. Uh, a highly controlled and aggressive environment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I can't imagine, I mean, going through the most personal and experience of your life and then being separated from this person that's been growing, growing inside of you for nine months. I mean, that's so, I don't even understand how that's legal and let alone like requiring vaccines, uh, to be seen. right what <laughs> i mean <laughs> <laughs> i know i know it's like women so i ha i have this legal paperwork that i've just been whoever emails me i just send it to them but it's basically if you test positive for covid because women in order to in order to get admitted into the hospital when they're in labor they have to test positive i mean negative for covid right and they matter? test alone Right. Yeah. Cause it matters. Right. And so they test alone in some triage room, their partner has to wait outside until they're cleared because if they test positive, the partner can't come in. She has to be isolated and birth alone. So there's paperwork that basically states, even if I test positive, I do not want to be separated from my baby. I assume all risk. I assume all risk that I will pass COVID to my child. I, you know, like it's all this really ridiculous language, but women want that paperwork because they still feel like they need to burden the hospital despite all of these hurdles that they know will be ahead of them. Um, and it's basically just saying like, I release the hospital from all liability if I test positive for COVID and I decline any routine separation from my baby. Because if the mother tests positive, what they're doing is they're keeping the baby isolated and observing it and making sure that it doesn't have any strange COVID symptoms. And, um, it's like, and the woman's there, you know, completely raw and vulnerable. And, um, and there's such a delicate window after birth where hormones are released, where the woman bonds with the baby. I mean, it's true for all mammals. Yeah. And so it's this it's delicate window where she needs to be breastfeeding, initiating that contact and doing what's called chemical skin imprinting with the baby. And so she's being robbed of that all because they're observing the child and, and, and performing in a system that really has no system. It's like, it's all just guesswork. So it's quite sad and disturbing. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, while they're separating mothers and babies, um, you know, people are flying elbow to elbow um, in planes and people are playing sports, um, you know, rubbing up against each other. There's no logic anymore. There's no logic. And that's the hardest part for me about all of it. Because I'm a very logical yeah. person. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this must be a really hard time for you. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. I mean, the, the amount of just gaslighting, pure and utter gaslighting of this entire year and a half. I mean, I'm surprised I have hair left because I just want to <laughs> pull it out. Right. Right. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Insanity. Insanity. So, I mean, yeah, it's great that this is an option for for mothers um, during this time. Um, let me see. What what should men know about this process? Do you have any advice for men? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to say here, but really specific to the pregnancy and the birth and the postpartum, which is this period after after the woman gives birth. Um, it's so important for men to be educated and to understand, right? Like it, so many men, you know, come to the classes with their partners and they say, you know, I'm here to do whatever she needs. Just let me know what I can do. And, you know, they're definitely willing to participate um, but they just don't know how. And so taking a class, a really good evidence-based 
a pro-medical freedom, pro-partnership class, uh, preferably in person, but there are some good ones online. Um, that's really going to shift this, this whole experience for the three of you, for your whole family. And um, I really, you know, in my classes, I really encourage the, the partner to learn what it is to create a container for the woman and for the experience. And um, they don't really know what that means because once they step into the doctor's office or the hospital setting, they, they're kind of stripped of whatever agency they have as a decision maker in the family process, in the, in the family dynamic, I should say. They're kind of like, well, whatever the doctor says, well, whatever the nurse says. And the woman sees this and is like, you're not protecting me. You're not advocating for me. Like you're basically giving up our rights and I need you to be an advocate. And so I really invite men to, under, to, to build their own conviction um, around why they're making certain birth choices, right? If you're choosing not to do an epidural or if you're choosing to have a home birth, if you're choosing not to circumcise, right? What are the convictions around that for you personally? Not just, oh, well, my wife wants this and I support her. What are your own personal convictions about this process? And that's really gonna be the fuel that allows you to, to create that container for her, that container of safety, right? Meaning she, she feels safe so she can dance and surrender. And when you don't know what's going on and you don't know what a placenta is and you don't know what a contraction is and you don't know, she's not going to feel safe to surrender and she's really going to be running the show on her own. And that is not <laughs> what this process is about. She really needs to get out of the survival mode, go into surrender mode and really feel like she can just experience this without fear and without needing like without feeling like she needs to be in the logistics and the planning and the protecting and the surviving so i really encourage males to and partners to um just be more cognizant of that and if she wants to take a birth class don't take one that that's just for the woman take one that is specifically for partner focused experience uh, you know, and I always tell my students, like, just to break the ice, you know, I'm always like, okay, guys, you're here to finish what you started. And you know, everybody laughs because it's true. Like, they don't realize, like, oh, I am a co-creator in this process. Of course. Why do you feel that you need to take the back seat now? Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say is really educate yourself. And, and you're here to, to protect this family. So how are you going to do that if not starting now in the birth process? Absolutely. Men need to step up for sure. Over this last year, we've, we've seen a decline in, in men stepping up, unfortunately. So um, very good advice. Um, uh, you did mention circumcision, which I wanted to ask you about. I've always been against it because I think it's just an old barbaric practice there's and it's another example of how we come with everything we need and that's you know just for whatever yeah. reason it's been stripped from us over yeah. whatever notion that it's bad or causes us harm or what have you yeah. what, what what are your um thoughts on that well you know i don't have a son <laughs> um I, was, I remember being so relieved when she was born. I was like, oh, I don't have to think about this. Um, but I do work with a lot of couples. And I'd say it's kind of split down the middle between people who feel very um, certain that that's just not a choice they would ever make. They would never choose to circumcise their son. And then there are other people who are kind of on the fence. Um, I do work with a lot of Orthodox uh, Jewish couples, families, and it's just part of their religious practice. And so we don't touch the subject matter. Um, but, you know, for people who are kind of just doing it because they think they're supposed to, the main reasons are, you know, I don't, my, my husband or my partner doesn't want their son to look different than he does. Um, or I don't want my son to get made fun of growing up or to be rejected by women for the way that his penis looks. Um, or, well, I don't know, the doctor told me I should because it's just more clean or it's for health reasons, you know, kind of these nebulous health reasons. Mm. Um, and so I do offer some education around that if people do bring it up. Um, I do bring it up in my classes. It's quite triggering for some people because men who are circumcised will say, well, I'm, I'm fine, look at me, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> um, nothing, <laughs> you know, everything's okay. Um, 
And I'm just so missing I part of my penis. I'm just missing part of my penis. <laughs> and it's partially, partially desensitized and it chafes. Um, Ugh. Ugh. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite challenging, but it is the, the amygdala is, is, goes into overdrive during this process they've done studies so for the people who rely on studies to make decisions about their life and their health um you know they've done studies on children while they're being circumcised and the parts of the brain that go into that, that become active um during post-traumatic stress episodes mm. um that's the part of the brain that is activated during this incredibly painful process even if the child has been anesthetized with lidocaine for example, lidocaine injection, they are still experiencing pain. Like there's, there's the pain, the body knows the pain. Uh, the, the subconscious knows the pain. Um, and some babies aren't even anesthetized because they don't know how the baby's going to react with lidocaine. Like we don't have a lot of studies on that. So a lot of doctors will say the baby's not going to remember this. Don't worry. It'll be very quick. He, he might cry, but usually babies don't cry. Everything's fine, you know? And so people will try to do it immediately after the birth so that the baby doesn't remember. You know, the baby will magically forget um, that part of their penis was removed. So, and so what happens is we sometimes see babies go totally stiff. They freeze, the eyes bulge, and they actually stop breathing. So they go into the freeze response, which is a survival mechanism where animals will do that in order to survive because if they were actually to step into the sensation and into the experience and try to fight it they might die right so it's a freeze response so people will say oh my baby it's so good you know he didn't even cry <laughs> but he he's been quiet for three days by such a good baby and i'm like uh <laughs> your baby in shock <laughs> yeah um, that's so much so, trauma for an infant, right? To have. It's so much trauma. And then they're bombarded with, you know, injections or other substances, right? Needles, uh, heel prick tests where they're, they're getting blood from the heel to screen for disorders, rare disorders. Uh, they're drawing blood um, every few hours at the hospital to check the blood sugar levels of the baby. Uh, it's like, <laughs> it's really, it's really... Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a butcher lab in there. And so mm. what I see, unfortunately, when I do postpartum visits, follow-up visits, breastfeeding consultations with my clients who have circumcised is that the baby is kind of listless, um, doesn't have a desire to breastfeed. Um, and this is just because they're in pain. They've experienced a traumatic event. Uh, they have no way to self-regulate. And uh, it's not that they're not hungry. It's not that they don't like breast milk because people say, my baby just didn't like breast milk. Um, that's not possible, you know? So it's just, it's just really sad because they end up having to supplement with formula because the baby's losing weight because it just doesn't have a desire to eat. So when it doesn't breastfeed, the woman's breast milk supply will decline because it's a supply and demand system. And then they go into this other spiral of dealing with this kind of like new, newborn infant issue of feeding. And, um, and then that's a whole other topic of what comes from formula feeding and bottle feeding as far as the baby's health um, and immunity. Mm. So circumcision does have long lasting effects, you know, not only for the male um, and his sexual partners and his experience in the world, but just also the, the, the years following the procedure and, and um, what comes after that, maybe reoccurring infection, you know, babies in a wet diaper all, all day. And there's this incision there, you know, where the penis, the part of the penis was removed, you know, the foreskin was removed and it's moist and it's wet and the mother doesn't know how to care for it properly. And the baby cries. It's just very stressful. Um, mm. You yeah, know, very unfortunate. So, I don't, I don't recommend it ever to anyone. I don't rec, you know, I, I don't not recommend it. I just give people as much information as I can so that they can make an informed decision. Um, and like anything, I, I, what people do on their own time to their own bodies is really not my business. I just don't want anything being required of me. Right. And I don't want anything being required of me to do to my daughter so that I can exist in society. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's such a strange thing, a strange thing, how things like that are normalized, you know, I mean, if we were doing that to, to 
female babies, you know, like cutting a part of their clitoris off, people would probably have something to say about it, you know. Which I they mean, do in parts of Africa. Yeah. They do, yeah. It's, and it's seen as mutilation, though, by, mm -hmm. our, by our, at least in our country. Um, so, right. but when you do that to a baby boy in the U.S., it's not considered mutilation. It's very strange. Right. I, I had a, quite a few adults write to me yesterday, say, oh, you know, my husband has had, you know, reoccurring yeast infections um, because he's not circumcised and it affects our marriage, affects our mm -hmm. sex life. We've tried everything. Um, you know, it's because of the foreskin. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's because of his gut, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's just um, there's a lot of misinformation, actual misinformation um, about what's going on with the foreskin and these kind of more topical issues that people want to blame the foreskin for. It's really coming from the gut. Everything comes from the gut. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one of the most common things that was being relayed to me yesterday um, about circumcision is that the foreskin is a breeding ground for disease and bacteria. And, yeah, of course. Um, that evil you know, bacteria. So, right. It's just a more victim mentality. but Right. Um, okay. So I wanted to ask you, and let me know if you run out of time at, at any point here. But um, yesterday I saw a pregnant woman wearing a mask mm. and I have read a little bit about this enough to know that uh, yeah it's probably not a good idea because uh, it's not even a good idea for normal people because um, <laughs> when you're pregnant it's not normal <laughs> <laughs> well you know what I mean but yeah. uh, people who aren't pregnant um, what are your views on pregnant women wearing masks uh, I mean, we know these things are like, especially the blue ones are sprayed with toxins. There's microplastics and not only that, but the whole oxygen intake thing, right? So basically since March 20, 2020, yeah, I'd say, let's say late March, early April, um, I started posting a little bit about this because there was an incident that happened actually in my neighborhood that was put on the Ring app. It's like a neighbor, like the neighborhood People talk about neighborhood things on the Ring app, which is yeah. a security system. And don't judge me for having cameras at my house. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm dealing, I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with that um, as existential crisis right now. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, it was reported that a woman, a pregnant woman, um, was wearing. You know, she, they didn't say she's wearing a mask, and this is why she passed out and fell on the ground. But there was a pregnant woman walking in the neighborhood, and she had passed out. And it's, you know, it gets pretty hot here in Miami. And so she passed out, fallen on the ground, hit her head and had a concussion. And she was still wearing the mask. Like I remember pe the people posted photos and they're like, who can, does anyone know who this is? And they were calling 911. Does anyone recognize her? We're not sure where she lives. And yeah, she was out for a walk. You know, truth, like we found out later, she was out for a walk and she was wearing a mask and she had been walking for about 20 minutes and just passed out. Um, so that's when I was like, oh my God, these pregnant women are, you know, they already have a very constricted lung capacity just because of the space that's taken up in the torso. So the lungs do receive compression um, during pregnancy. And so that's why some women get winded going up the stairs and when they do extensive exercise. And so to be walking in the heat and wearing a mask alone outside, I was like, this has got to stop. You know, this is actually dangerous. You know, if people want to wear masks, you know, do their own thing, whatever. But pregnant women, like this is totally dangerous. So I started posting about that a little bit. Um, I still see it going on, you know. Um, I think at this point, it's like <laughs> there's, I don't know what can be done about it. Um, people are really just convinced that um, the mask protects them from contracting this virus, even if they've been vaccinated, which is, which is a really hot topic right now because um, the CDC is recommending that pregnant women vaccinate mm -hmm. with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, OBs, doctors on Instagram, <laughs> I don't know if they're real or not, but they are recommending that pregnant women get vaccinated. And um, I've had two women in my care, you know, as a, as a teacher and as a doula, lose their pregnancies around 28 weeks after being vaccinated wow. 28 weeks is a really it's really late in the game to just randomly have a miscarriage yeah um and so 
even even these women who are fully vaccinated and believe in the vaccine are still wearing masks and inhibiting their oxygen intake. So there's not much that can be done besides continuing to try and share information on how dangerous it is to limit your oxygen intake while pregnant. Yeah. Um, I see them out in public yeah. wearing them and I'm just like, oh man, it's so hard not to like go up to them and be like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I know. I know. It, it really is. Trust me. I've had to like completely <laughs> numb myself yeah. when I go to pub, when I go out in public. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, as far as the, the vaccine, I did get a question. Well, I want to go into some of the like the placenta encapsulation because I have no idea what that is. <laughs> and um, and uh, somebody asked about, you know, have you noticed any um, anything with the placentas as far as like vaccinated mothers? Um, she said that uh, she's heard something about uh, them being hard and having blood clots or something like that. Have you witnessed anything like that? So I work with about four to five placentas a week. And um, I'll tell you what I have noticed over the years and then more specifically now with COVID um, is that when women uh, receive Pitocin, which is a synthetic form of oxytocin, the placentas tend to be like more, um, for lack of a better word, kind of like shredded up. They're not as whole and smooth. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that women with exclusively plant-based diets have um, kind of like more flaccid looking placentas where they, they're they not as kind of whole and robust and full. Mm -hmm. They seem um, malnourished is what the placenta looks like. And this is in no way knocking plant-based diets. I'm just saying, um, during pregnancy, we should be practicing an omnivore diet, but that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, with COVID vaccines, I, I don't ask any of my clients if they've been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Some people just contact me for placenta encapsulation and I do not ask questions. All I wanna know is if they're HIV positive or Hep B, C positive, because then my, my process of preparing it is a little different. Um, so I don't know, because I do see a lot of clotted, I do see a lot of blood clots coming through, um, definitely a little more than I used to see. Mm -hmm. And it could be that even women who have not been vaccinated, maybe their husband has, um, you know, I still don't know where, I still don't know enough about spike proteins and shedding to really have an opinion on this. Um, that's like where I'm really split and confused. So I definitely want to understand a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do see a lot of blood clots. I have to like physically go in and remove them. Uh, you don't want a lot of those in the encapsulation process. Um, so yeah, I bet I don't see anything like strange, uh, more strange than before. Really, what I do notice is with the plant-based diet, it looks kind of like, like, like a, like if the if a lung had like carcinoma, it was like it kind of has this strange color as well. So I noticed that with oh. the plant-based diets, they look very different, and then with pitocin, women who've received pitocin. So yeah, okay. but I, I, I maybe if I started you know asking questions, which I don't ask anyone about about their vaccine status, like on principle. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's um, actually, yeah, good for you. <laughs> you shouldn't. I just sound like, I don't want to know. Can we just like pretend this never happened? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then this whole thing about uh, placenta encapsulation, um, what's that all about? So um, the all mammals that I know of um, consume their placenta immediately after the birth, think except dolphins. Um, and it's a way to replenish the body after the marathon of birth. Uh, it's a way that an animal can get some sustenance and, you know, they're not in, they're not in a position to go hunting. Perhaps they don't know when they're going to get food next. So mm -hmm. they consume the placenta. Uh, it's also a way for a mammal to cover up their tracks so that predators can't track them after the birth when they're in a very vulnerable position. And so when I learned this, like over 10 years ago, I was like, wow, 
you know, if I ever have a child, I'm definitely doing this. And as I started doing birth work, of course, I came into contact with a lot of placentas and um, trained to, to encapsulate them, prepare them. Um, and so what, what we you, find do, in I placentas... Mean, what, are you like putting this in a milkshake? Like, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes actually. Oh so, my goodness. so yeah, there's... Um, so traditionally, when women would have hemorrhaging, postpartum bleeding after the birth, midwives in different cultures would tear off a piece of the placenta, just, you know, maybe a two inch piece and have the mother, you know, maybe dip it in honey or something, just have the mother swallow it whole and it would instantly contract the uterus and stop the bleeding. Wow. Um, and so that was, for me, that was also a huge um, bonus. I was like, okay, I need to know more about this. I wonder, you know, what are, what are the capsules going to do? And so the, the point of the capsules really is to give the woman an extended benefit over time. So when I receive the placenta, I inspect it. I look at the amniotic sac. I look at where the, the umbilical cord has inserted itself. That tells me a little bit um, about the baby, about the mother, maybe about her diet, maybe about how the everything was formed. Um, it's very fascinating. And so after I've inspected it, I will then cut off umbilical cord. And if it's long enough, I might make a keepsake if that's what they've requested of me. Otherwise, I dehydrate it. I set it aside and I dehydrate it. With the rest of the placenta, if the woman wants a smoothie, I'll take a piece off and I'll bring it to her. We'll prepare a smoothie and she'll drink it after the birth. It's like raw nourishment, um, iron hormones, stem cells. And then I will dehydrate the rest of the placenta um, for about 18 hours. And then it kind of turns into a really dry jerky, so to speak. And then it's pulverized in a grinder. Um, and after it's pulverized, it's put into capsules and then the woman takes that as a supplement after the birth. So the, the amount of capsules you're going to get vary depending on the size of the placenta. It can be anywhere from 100 to 250, depending on the size of the placenta. So I also make tinctures. So I'll, I'll steep a wow. piece of placenta in grain alcohol, and it creates kind of like a homeopathic tincture, right? Where the, it extracts the essence of the placenta into the alcohol and the woman can use that throughout her life. You know, she can take drops you know, drops of it, half droppers, whatever. Uh, when her period returns, her cycle returns, she can start taking that just to kind of ease the transition if she's having any cramping or discomfort or an emotional state that she would like to balance. Um, so there's many things that can be done with it. Um, I've actually seen once in my life, which I was very fortunate to see where the baby was not breathing after the birth. So the baby was out and the placenta came out and the midwife actually took the placenta while it was still connected to the baby, yeah. right? So you have the, you have the baby, you have the umbilical cord and then the placenta and it's connected. And so she took the placenta and she put it into hot water and started massaging it. And the blood from the placenta and whatever oxygen was there and stem cells were there started traveling back to the baby. This kind of life force was traveling back to the baby and it initiated the baby's breathing. And that was after like maybe 90 seconds of no breathing. That's wild. At the hospital, they would immediately cut the umbilical cord. They would begin doing, you know, very classic resuscitation, uh, more aggressive. And so after seeing that, I was totally a believer that there's um, so much power um, to this organ that the woman creates over the have, course of the pregnancy. I have to ask, what does a placenta taste like? And don't say like chicken. <laughs> no, people, people have told me that alligator tastes like chicken. I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, nothing else tastes like chicken. I like, I don't know where that phrase came from, but it, I don't want to say liver because it's not, it's not, um, stinky. It's not, it doesn't have a pungent taste or really smell. Uh -huh. um, kind of smells like iron, you know, the, the blood. Um, some people have said that it, the texture when they've eaten it, because some people, um, a client of mine in Hawaii, she um, cut it up and sauteed it with onions and ate it like wow. placenta and onions. Like people would do liver and onions, for example. And she wow. just said it was kind of like the same texture for her as steak. Um, but the flavor is unique. 
and um, it's not something you're going to be eating every day. So it's like, for me, the, for me, the benefit of, of what it can offer, like supersedes whatever, like discomfort that I might have with the flavor, which is how I grew up. Cause I grew up with a mother who's a naturopath. So it's like, I was eating a lot of unsweetened things and um, maca powder and Lord knows what else. So it's like, I just learned to find pleasure in knowing the benefits of what I was consuming, even if it didn't taste great. Um, So. Yeah, a lot of things are like that, right? Um, (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's that's amazing. I didn't know there were so many uh, uses for that. Um, I just have a couple more questions here. Um, Yeah. Okay. Uh, How do you handle high-risk pregnancies? My friend actually asked this question. How do you handle high-risk pregnancies uh, like gestational diabetes with insulin? Are they candidates for doulas and home births and all that? They're definitely candidates for doulas because a doula can go into a hospital but they're not candidates for working with a midwife at a home in a home set, a home setting. Um, the thing about gestational diet. So if it's like type two diabetes, that's different, but gestational diabetes that comes with pregnancy, the woman, you know, the woman suddenly develops gestational diabetes, maybe in like her second or third trimester. Um, that's usually due to diet. And I've seen women reverse the diagnosis of gestational diabetes by shifting their diet, adopting something that's very um, focused in more Weston Price diet or Dr. Tom Brewer diet, um, fat and protein oriented and removing sugars and carbohydrates. Um, And so I've seen women do that. And so they wouldn't be a candidate for home birth, but they are certainly capable to reverse it and then switch to a home birth setting if they would like. Um, but yeah, there's just certain things that midwives can't touch. You know, they, they, um, mm-hmm. there would be no point because the woman with gestational diabetes that goes untreated is going to need blood pressure support at the hospital. Uh, she's going to need to be monitored. The baby's going to need to be monitored. So it's like, yeah. And that's why when people say, oh, you know, home birth is so dangerous. I'm like, oh, (laughs) very few, there's very few transfers that I know of in home birth because the woman going into a home birth is low risk and she's healthy. So the chances of something like some surprise freak occurrence happening is rare. Um, And we see a lot of urgent situations in hospitals because a lot of these women are high risk or they're medicating uh, voluntarily. So yeah, that's that's the most common high risk situation. Twins is considered high risk if they share a sac and they share a placenta. So there are certain situations where you would want to be in a hospital, and you would want to maybe have an elected C-section. In my opinion, I know there's some people who don't believe in that. They you know they're kind of like whatever God gives you, God makes no mistakes. You know, and I totally respect that for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if I had twins or triplets and they shared one placenta and one sac, the problem is that if one comes out vaginally and the placenta detaches, then the other two are, their oxygen is compromised and they could die. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's not, you know, but if you have twins and they each have their own sac and their own placenta, you could do a home birth. So depends on the type of twin situation, right? So, Yeah. The hospital's there for emergency situations. And the the issue here is really trying to deduce what is an emergency and what isn't. And that's where all the work is. You know, that's where the journey is, is really knowing um, and researching that. Sure. Uh, another question from my Telegram group here. Uh, and I don't know if maybe you touched on this because I don't know what a vernix is. <laughs> but it says... Um, oh, question about leaving the vernix on for one to two days does that help protect a baby yeah so i don't know if you've seen photos of newborns and they are cut cut, covered in this kind of waxy white coating have you ever seen that yeah Uh, so um, vernix cassio said it's a waxy white coating um 
it's something that the baby develops in the womb to keep them hydrated once they come out. It gives them kind of like a glide as they're moving mm -hmm. through the birth canal. And it also has antibodies and antivirals and antibacterials <laughs> so that when they're out in the world, they're protected. Right. That's, that's what we've, what we've been told. Um, it also keeps them warm. It's kind of like an insulating layer. Sure. So I don't recommend that it's ever wiped off, that it's ever rubbed in, that it's ever washed off. Um, it naturally will absorb into the skin of the baby over the course of the hours after the birth. Um, the only thing I do recommend is that women like take a little bit of it and put it on their face because <laughs> it's incredibly nutritive and hydrating. Um, so that's another way of doing some sk chemical skin imprinting with your baby. But yeah, I don't ever recommend taking that off. I don't recommend baths after the birth. I don't recommend ever using soap on your baby. Hmm. Um, I recommend that if you want to cleanse your baby throughout that whole first year, um, you know, soap is a whole topic, but throughout that first year, they don't need to be scrubbed or like suds or lathered or whatever. Um, they just need gentle cleansing with, with water and oil and a washcloth. You know, if you really feel like they got dirty um, or if they, you know, they seem stinky to you. Uh, so, yeah, I don't recommend, <laughs> I don't recommend baths unless it's for bonding. And, you know, I like it when dads bathe with the babies in a bathtub and they can really use that, ex that experience, that opportunity to bond with the child. But if it's for like cleaning purposes, I don't recommend soaps, lotions, uh, talcum powders, colognes, uh, definitely don't recommend any of that. Very cool. All right. Well, I never, never knew what Vernix was and now I do. And that, that's just kind so of exciting. Um, that's really magical <laughs> to me. Yeah. I bet you could bottle that stuff, sell it. Oh my God. Um, that's my like long running <laughs> joke is like, <laughs> you know, that's my like lottery ticket, right? It's like yeah. bottling the Vernix. It's like 10 grand an ounce. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> So being somebody that has witnessed however many births now, what has, what has being a part of so many births made you realize about life? Well, what became super apparent to me was the contract that this woman and this father have made with this child. Um, the contract meaning what they decided before they came in here, before they incarnated into this physical existence. And so witnessing so many births, it was like, it's what, what captivates me and what really moves me to tears is that a lot of these people in this physical existence aren't even cognizant of this contract that they've all made, the three of them. <laughs> And so when I see them all come together in the physical, I'm like, you all plan this, like you plan this, you, you finally have it. Like how beautiful is it that what you planned to co-create together is here. Um, and the responsibility and the gift that comes with having this child um, and the deep love and trust that they have, I mean, they chose you to be their parents. So it's like, what, what better thing is there to know that this person chose you to be the one that ushers them into this physical experience? Like that the depth of that love and that trust is just so moving. Um, it's like, wow, <laughs> there's nothing more romantic for me than that type of um, trust and love that, that they're showing you. And so that being a gift, um, it's also that the other side of that coin is that it, it can become deeply heartbreaking when um, I do see some families, you know, kind of lose that luster and they, they want to go back to work after six weeks because they want their life back um, and they want things to go back to normal. And that phrase, I can't, I can't believe, believe I even said that, um, but you know, they want their life to go back to the way that it was before they had the baby, or they want to, you know, start going back to Pilates right away because they need to do this or they need to do that. And the baby starts getting left with a nanny or, you know, it's just, wow, like you've just received this gift and now you're trying to find a way to manage it and you don't, you're not, you haven't yet integrated it into your existence. And so 
with that, that beautiful awareness that I've developed about this contract that they've all made together, it comes kind of some heartbreak for me when I see um, the lack of awareness about the gifts that they've been given. Um, so that's something that's really become clear for me and really big for me every time I'm at a birth. It's like the space that I'm in. Um, and something else is, is how redemptive birth can be for women who've had potentially very disempowering um, upbringings or disempowering, a series of very disempowering events happen in their life. And birth can be so redemptive because it is the ultimate ex expression of our, of our capabilities, both physically, spiritually, and mentally. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing to witness. Beautifully said. Where can people find you? Um, you have a lot of things to offer, even offer photography, which I didn't get to touch on. But uh, yeah, tell us where you, where we can all find you. Yeah, I mean, just head over to my website, alacuenca.com. And I have an Instagram as well, mm -hmm. um, alacuenca birth, and a Telegram channel where I put some more, you know, uh, <laughs> hot topics. I share a little bit more of the hot topics on Telegram. Um, yeah, but I work with, I work with couples and women and families all over the world. You know, it's the beautiful thing about the digital age is just being able to connect with people everywhere. So even if there are not resources in your area, but you still want to go on this journey, you know, we can definitely do that or I can help you find resources wherever you are. So, yeah. Okay, Ayla Cuenca, thank you so much for uh, for chatting with me today. I learned so, so much, and uh, man, I'm so happy I met you. Yeah, me too. So beautiful. <laughs> no, no coincidence. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Sure, anytime. <laughs> All right, take care. All right, bye. Take care.